Yeah, I can record. All right, good. The people who had signed up uh, set. So we're just gonna give it another minute or two and then I'll start off with everything and I'll go through some of the sort of technical aspects to help us. So we'll just give it a minute or two, thanks. But we're really gonna talk more about cellular-based treatments and I'll talk about what stem cells are and are not, uh, what treatments we do and, and what the differences and specifics are. So again, our focus is orthopedic related or musculoskeletal, which would include bone problems, muscle, tendon, joint, cartilage, ligaments, spine related issues, including spinal nerves. Um, the things we're not gonna really talk about, but if there's some questions, I uh, am fairly well versed in this type of field. I can uh, at least give some comments related to non-orthopedic issues, such as MS, COPD, uh, even the, the COVID thing. Um, hair loss, cardiac stroke, et cetera. Dr. Andrews is a fairly well-known uh, orthopedic physician in Alabama, and uh, he sees a lot of the uh, football and baseball stars. When they get injured, they usually hear from the sports announcers that they're having an MRI tonight, and then they're gonna see and have an appointment with Dr. Andrews tomorrow. Now, things are a little different without sports and without travel, but he had said that, you know, the advent of the arthroscope was just sort of revolutionary and felt the next wave of uh, innovation would be biologics. Again, sort of what we're going to talk about tonight is the orthobiologic or cell-based treatments, not the quote-unquote true stem cells, which again, I'll define later. So with that, we'll just uh, take you a little bit into um, our clinic and, and a sort of typical patient we would see. So this is a 62-year-old gentleman that, at the time. He was a former runner. He enjoys walking, tennis, gardening. He had his right knee replaced about two years before he saw us. Did well, no complications, but you know, knew it was a fairly complex recovery. He really wasn't into having that on his left side. So the surgeon who saw him said, you know, whenever you're ready for your left knee replacement, just come on in and we'll treat you. So he had had physical therapy, steroid injections. So the hyaluronic acid injections called the new oil, uh, lubricating joints, gel shots, chicken shots, uh, synvisc injection. So a lot of different names for the same kind of thing. Um, but with all those treatments, he still was limited by the pain he had. Again, didn't want surgery. So what are his options or what is he going to do next? So we'll get back to him a little later. So what are regenerative or cell-based treatments? Well, there are stem cell treatments that come from you and go to you. They're called autologous. They're allogenic treatments that come from someone else and go into you. Uh, and the stem cells most people talk about for orthopedic issues are mesenchymal stem cells. And then the repairment of the body, undifferentiated slates. And so what does that mean? Well, one way you can sort of think about it is that they're the general contractor and they get into an area and they potentially can coordinate healing. Although as we learn more things that may not be exactly what's happening. A lot of the things that people have written about or people talk about are what we call in vitro research. So you put this on the Petri dish, the cell turns into cartilage, and we say, hey, this is great. You put it on your knee, you get cartilage. That's really not what's happening. Dr. Kaplan at Case Western, who named stem cells, stem cells, uh, really wants to change the MSC or mesenchymal stem cell name to the medicinal signaling cell. Because in our bodies or in vivo, that's really what these cells are doing. They're coordinating the healing response or modulating the, uh, the sort of process of what's going on that causes pain. So one of the processes is to take blood, which is where we get the platelets from, concentrate platelets and growth factors, and then we can use that as a treatment. Um, true stem cell sources can be from cord blood, amniotic tissues, embryonic, uh, synovial tissue. Uh, they're generally someone else's cells, and we'll talk about why that is. Uh, and they're really, almost no FDA approved stem cell treatments, um, except for maybe reconstituting bone marrow if you have a bone marrow issue. Um, at least nothing really for uh, orthopedic related issues. There are a few companies who've asked the FDA for an IND, an investigational new drug. So they're researching what it is. Uh, one of our colleagues at Personalized Stem Cell in California have an investigational new drug application to research fat stem cells from you, autologous, and go back to you for knee arthritis. They've also recently got a uh, IND to investigate fat stem cells. They can go into other people, allogenic, 
for um, COVID related problems called ARDS or pulmonary problems. And that research will be starting soon. So there are definitely some research things that are going through the appropriate channels at FDA and uh, looking at how these are going to be viable treatments or not in the future. So again, autologous, it comes from you and goes back to you. Source is bone marrow or fat usually. Um, and we don't really use these as stem cell sources, but as uh, tissues for autologous or per same person to same person transplant to stimulate healing with a cell-based treatment. So what do we treat? Well, one of the definitions is arthritis because it's one of the most common things out there. Uh, 2014, uh, we had about 5.6% uh, of GDP was spent on musculoskeletal issues, which is more than the actual um, defense budget at that time. So there's a lot of things going on with arthritis and back pain and headaches are pretty much the top three causes of lost time from work. So these are uh, common and debilitating and impact people's quality of life as well as their work. So this is really what people talk about as my knee is worn out or the wear and tear degeneration of a joint. Arthritic condition is pretty common in the hip and the knee, the shoulder, uh, fingers, and other joints also. So generally you have arthritis, you go see a physician, they recommend physical therapy, anti-inflammatories such as Aleve or Advil, Motrin, something like that. If they're helpful, great, home exercise, you got over that and uh, hopefully all goes well for you. If not, or it recurs, the option is visco supplementation, which is that hyaluronic acid, usually a series of three to five injections. Hopefully that gives you six to 12 months of relief and can be repeated. If you did well, people can do well for years with that. Uh, sometimes when people do well for say eight months, the next time they get it, it's six months, the next time they get it, they have two months of relief, the next time they get it, they may have a couple weeks of relief and then they don't do so well. So then that'll be some of the patients we might see. The other option could be a corticosteroid or a steroid injection in the knee. Again, that could be beneficial temporarily. Um, generally, they don't do a lot, but potentially could weaken the cartilage and accelerate knee arthritis or joint arthritis degeneration. Um, again, if it's helpful, that's great. Home exercises, keep it strong, keep it moving, uh, improve your quality of life, that's wonderful. If not, then you go to a potential variety of surgeries. And a lot of these surgeries have been shown really not to do too well, uh, such as, quote, cleaning out the joint. Again, they can give you a few months relief at best, but generally will accelerate knee arthritis, something called a high tibial osteotomy. They can actually be quite uh, effective, but it's a pretty big procedure. Uh, and then there's the total joint replacement. Again, total joint replacements are great. Um, they can be very uh, good and predictable. They have a low incidence of complications, but their complications when they uh, arise can be fairly significant, such as death, pulmonary embolism, um, stroke, things like that. Uh, additionally, they're not all they're cracked up to be at times, right? So um, about 12 months after the uh, procedure or the surgery, about 30% of people with knee replacements still have five out of 10 knee pain. So that's pretty significant. And when it works though, it can be fantastic. So again, uh, you know, the common things for joint replacements would be the hip and knee. Uh, less common but becoming more common are the shoulder. Again, there are more uh, stringent criteria because it's a very mobile joint and it's not quite as predictable. Uh, things such as the elbow, ankle, wrist, fingers, uh, they just don't do as well unless you're around a, uh, a very high level area. We're lucky to have hospital for special surgery near us. If you're in Boston, you have some, uh, you know, like uh, uh, New England Baptist. Uh, so if you're in some of the uh, larger cities or metropolitan areas, you may have some uh, high level experts that can do some of these joints and have uh, good outcomes. Like I said, uh, for total joints, uncommon, but when they happen, they can be fairly significant. I think one of the worst things would really be to have an infection in your joint. The full body, they have to take it out, treat you with antibiotics, not so good for your gut. Uh, and then you're sitting on a shelf for a few weeks until they potentially can put it back in. Uh, they can have a fracture, you can have a nerve injury, the prosthesis can become unstable or loosened. Uh, and then another big problem is the... Uh, hip more commonly, but hardware, the metal can actually break down microscopically and lead to metal poisoning. And as I said before, you still could have residual pain despite the surgery. So as you can see here, it's a small little incision where they can flay open the front of the knee uh, and take out your arthritic knee that's causing pain and put in some metal. Again, the problem is that this is a long recovery period and you don't really feel, quote, back to normal until about six months. 
Hips do substantially better. It's a much easier and quicker recovery, um, but you have to worry about dislocation in the short term and, and being uh, preca having precautions to avoid those potentials for dislocation. Shoulder, uh, initially they would uh, try to mimic normal anatomy, but as the rotator cuff would pull on that shoulder to move it up and lift over your head, it would take that, slide it north. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but that ball would slide up into the acromion that would still be the bony roof and pinch it. And so with that, they started doing a reverse shoulder. So instead of the concave side on the uh, shoulder blade, they would put the convex or ball side and then as you lift it up with your arm, that would rotate it out uh, sort of by anatomic necessity. And so the problem with that is that they just haven't been done as long. Um, you have to be a very select type patient to see if you're a candidate. And it's a quite long and arduous recovery. Uh, for the ankle, wrists, uh, fingers, toes, there are really not a lot of great ideas for uh, replacing these things. So a lot of times uh, if they want to treat pain, they can just do it by stopping motion. And they do that with screws and plates to just uh, fuse the joint and you stop the motion and you don't have the pain. But you've lost motion and motion has to go somewhere. So sometimes joints above and below will suffer. Same thing, little screws, little uh, devices uh, to stop that motion and reduce the pain. So what do we do here at New Jersey Regenerative Institute? But well, we institute another treatment option. We're not the panacea, we're not the cure-all. Uh, we are just an option that may fit in there. You know, if you take a joint out, you've pretty much burned your bridges. If you try this treatment option and it's not as successful as you want, or uh, it does well for a couple of years and then you, know, you don't really wanna repeat it, you always have the option for surgery. Uh, but if you go for surgery, usually you can't go backwards. So again, our goal is to try to um, unleash your body's intrinsic ability to heal itself. I believe that God's given us everything that we need, and we just have to figure out how to harness that and get that to work. We have a lab that we process things in, that we test in it. Uh, we treat with everything that comes from the individual patient that goes back to that patient. Our, our um, injections are all guided, whether by ultrasound or x-ray or a combination. So we do whatever we need to do to make sure that that treatment is done uh, effectively and appropriately. Again, here's a picture of our lab so that we have the ability to process by hand, to change concentrations if we need more or less uh, volume or cells in an area. We count the cells, we know what we're injecting, and we quantify these things. So what is stem cell I alluded to earlier? Well, stem cell by the FDA is really taking a cell out, propagating that cell or growing it, so there's a pure stem cell line that can be uh, quantified and they can be reproduced. And that really cannot be done at point of care. And if you start doing that, it's called more than minimal manipulation. And therefore you become um, a drug and manufacturing a drug and you have to go through FDA. So it's not that you can't do it, it's just it's a different process of doing it. So everything we do in our office is a uh, same day um, practice of medicine and it's not a manipulation of cells uh, that would be classified as a drug. So what's the process if a person uh, you know, considers this as an option? Well, the first thing is we do a consultation. So a history that's thorough, specific to your whole uh, health and wellness, not just your knee joint uh, myopically or uh, only focused on the knee. Thorough exam of the joints above and below, neurologic, sort of how your health and wellness is, your activities, your desired goals hobbies, work, et cetera. Review any imaging you have, or if we need to, we'll order some imaging. And then we can potentially determine or discuss the eligibility and our research um, outcomes we have and the potential for your uh, likelihood of outcome being successful. So in regards to say a bone marrow procedure, uh, bone marrow procedure, you would come in, all this stuff is pretty much done one day, it's all done in our office. So you're avoiding surgical centers and hospitals and the potential for COVID risk. Uh, our office is clean, we take COVID precautions, uh, we have a high touch, low volume practice, we clean everything, we've always been doing that. Uh, we never want an infection, so we're very diligent about doing all this stuff even before COVID. Um, if it's gonna be bone marrow, we would have you on our x-ray table that we have in the office. We can see the back side of your pelvis, numb things up very well, put a needle into the bone marrow and take out the bone marrow. Goes to our lab, we process the cells, comes back, 
and under x-ray or ultrasound we can place it in the knee or the joint that we want or need to get the problem site. And then the problem is none of us want to wait and none of us uh, have patience but um, you know like anything if you cut yourself you don't heal tomorrow right we can't really speed up biology um, just like planting a seed or planting a vegetable it takes time. So you may feel fantastic in the short term because some of these cells will attach to the receptors around the joint and will cause almost like a morphine effect. Dr. Kaplan uh, identified that and published that recently. So that's really what the acute 24 hour benefit is. And then you go back to the way you were and you go like, hey, why did I do that? Um, I'm no better, failed. Now what it really takes is three to four weeks is probably the earliest time until you'll see some benefit. And then that continues to improve. We generally see people about six weeks after the procedure. So not the most amount of effect, but some. That's generally when we'll start some physical therapy. And then most people will plateau somewhere around three months or so, uh, and then can maintain that for one to five years, depending on what we're treating and some of the research that's been put out there. Uh, we don't have as good or as long of uh, research as we would like, uh, but we are um, contributing to research to try to figure that out for uh, future people. So back to our gentleman that we talked about in the beginning who had the arthritic knee. So he had some bone marrow taken out and the treatment done in December of 2012. He's still doing very well seven years later. He's walking, he's playing doubles tennis. Well, I don't know if he's playing doubles tennis going to the gym right now with COVID, uh, but if he has problems, he's really complaining more about his right-sided replaced knee than his left-sided uh, cellular treated knee. Other treatments that we can do or other areas we can treat are tendons and ligaments, such as the rotator cuff, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, uh, jumper's knee or patella tendon, hip bursitis, which is really degeneration of the tendon that attaches to the side of the hip, the Achilles tendon, the bottom of the foot called the plantar fascia, partial ACL tears, which is in the knee, uh, labral tears of the hip and shoulder, and then the meniscus, the shock absorber in the knee, uh, those degenerative tears also. In the spine, pinched nerves, if you uh, have a medical problem like uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, and the steroid could be a problem with that, uh, we can take your blood in and do probably a similar kind of response. Doesn't work as quick, but lasts potentially a little longer. Uh, disc herniations, degenerative disc disease, we can take bone marrow or platelet-rich plasma and put it in the discs. Uh, facets are the little tiny joints behind the discs and paired up and down the spine. They can get arthritic just like a knee joint, and they can cause a lot of pain in the neck or the low back. We can inject those with PRP and that can be beneficial or the ligaments around those that stabilize it. Um, peripheral nerves such as carpal tunnel uh, or other nerve injuries, uh, injecting PRP and other things can be beneficial and help those recover. So what are the questions that a lot of people ask us in our uh, daily life or when we do these lectures? Number one, is it safe? And I think that's all of medicine. First of all, do no harm. So this is a study that Regenix had looked at, as well as uh, we've looked at other data, and that it's safe. So there are post-procedure problems, meaning that people have pain and swelling. That's really just part of the procedure, not so much a risk or a safety issue. Um, we've probably had one person maybe with an infection developing around their thigh for a knee injection. We didn't really wait for it to get to be an in uh, infection or cellulitis. We treated them with antibiotic and they were fine. Um, so that's pretty much our only problem. Um, people in this group, you know, do get cancer, like the general population, but it's not from this procedure. Um, you know, if you see me as a consult and you get hit by a bus, it's not because you saw me for a consult. So the research study actually looked at and showed their lower incidence of people having cancers with uh, being treated with regenerative medicine. Now, that's not to say that regenerative medicine is a... Uh, you know, curative or treatment. It's just to say that the incidence is no higher. So that's usually a big question we get. And then what the recovery is like, we talked a little bit about, but generally have the procedure, reduce your activity for about four days. Um, sometimes we immobilize, but generally the goal is that pain is protective. Uh, pain has limited you from what you were doing before you saw us. And generally after that acute period, your body is gonna tell you, and as long as you listen to it and have common sense, that's usually the only restrictions we have. If we do a fat procedure, we may give a little more restriction of where we took the fat from because you could have a little bleeding there. Uh, we also would compress that area with a compressive garment to make sure there's no bleeding. Um, biggest 
sort of absolute is no anti-inflammatories. The anti-inflammatories can slow down the healing. So uh, we want to make sure that people don't use those. Pain medications, we give you a few tablets of pain medications. Generally, people will take it about 45 minutes before a procedure and then may need two or three tablets after. So, you know, this isn't something where people have a lot of pain and need to take a lot of pain medication. Limitations, sort of the same thing that the pain and the process you came to us limited you by is about what we maintain for about four to six weeks. See us back at about six week follow up. Generally, we would institute a course of physical therapy. The therapy is generally focused at um, addressing those compensatory things that you have uh, sort of adopted as a habit to offload the area that we treated. So we're gonna try to undo those bad habits that you developed. So people ask, well, how can I make this, you know, a better outcome or how can I make this a, a better result? Well, generally, uh, we talk a lot about uh, general overall health and wellness. Why? Cells are coming from you, going to you. The healthier someone is, the better they're going to do. We've treated um, healthy 90-year-olds, and they've done well. Um, so if you smoke, drink, have diabetes, uh, that might be a problem. It might slow down your healing. Stronger and the more rehab the area is, the potential for quicker and greater recovery Good diet, potentially supplements could be beneficial as we talk about health and wellness. And avoiding certain medications. So some medications like cholesterol lowering medications uh, and anti-inflammatories I had talked about could be a problem and we'll discuss it on an individual basis. Is it covered by insurance? Well, right now the short answer is no. It's considered experimental um, and no one's looking to cover more things and pay for more. Uh, we are trying to work with you know, insurance companies like Workers' Comp to show that it's a cost-effective treatment. We have an article that we're trying to get published that shows that if you delay total knee replacements, you can actually save a significant amount of money, um, as well as um, hopefully having less uh, adverse events uh, with at least the same amount of efficacy. Now, that's something to be determined as we, uh, as we move forward. Again, is it FDA approved, everybody asked for? Again, a little bit of a loaded question, and sometimes when people are asking it, they don't quite know what that means. Um, but the FDA has no purview in the practice of medicine. Each state has a state board of medical examiners that uh, really or look over and see uh, how the practice of medicine is by an individual physician. Everything we do stays within that purview of um, the practice of medicine. Uh, the FDA really, as I spoke with about earlier, is they have the regulatory capacity for drugs. And if you're not doing things in the right manner and you make a drug in your office, you really have to go through the FDA's pathway. They passed the 21st Century Cures Act, a way to make it a little more easier for regenerative medicine, they call RMATs, to get approvals and to get evaluation for safety and efficacy. So FDA is not bad, they're doing their job. Their job is to protect the public uh, and they're trying to do that while still allowing um, the physicians to have a different pathway from drugs to see how their particular product would work uh, for a particular problem. And they have that for people to, to move forward with. So what separates us from um, sort of other practices or disciplines of medicine? Well, we all have a non-surgical background. So we're not just uh, gonna do this as an add-on to surgery. We're not gonna do this and if it fails, we can always do surgery. Our goal is to do this and try to keep you away from the surgeon. We all have expertise in ultrasound and guided injections. We train people and do courses for ultrasound. Um, Dr. Malang actually has a book published regarding ultrasound. We have a lab, as we said earlier, so we can count things, we can test different um, products that we have. So if uh, drug reps or pharmaceutical reps come in, they have whether different devices, needles, whatever it is, uh, we can look at that in our lab and say, does this actually, uh, at least in our hands, reproduce what these, uh, these industry uh, representatives have said. And if it is, then we adopt it. And if it's not, then um, you know, we'll move on. We contribute to research as I alluded to. Next month, coming attractions, Dr. Malango will be speaking about the research we're doing in our office. So if people are interested in that, we're right now doing things with the knee, the shoulder, and the low back. Uh, so those are interesting things. We've uh, published on wheelchair athletes for people with rotator cuff problems who can't undergo surgery and they've done well. We waited sort of for um, people to publish data and have you know, outcomes. Everybody talked about how well things happened, but nobody really did it. So myself, Dr. Malang, and two other individuals started a company called Data Biologics. 
And data biologics is really to look at incorporating every patient that's treated with regenerative medicine, to see how they do, and to find out what is the uh, safety profile, what is the most cost-effective treatment for an individual process or disease. Uh, and hopefully that will advance research with real-world data. And right now we have uh, about 30 clinics in the world. Uh, we are collecting data uh, through multiple clinics, and we're trying to improve that and look for funding. So uh, hopefully that will be something that will contribute to medical uh, research as well as everyday patient life and be able to uh, show what works, what doesn't, and give you informed decisions about moving forward with your treatment. So I want to thank everybody for hanging in there with me. Um, went a few minutes longer than I anticipated. Uh, I'll open it up to Rachel to ask me any questions or clarifications about what I spoke about. Our office number is on the screen. I'll leave it there. So if you want a consultation, if you want to have any questions about what I talked about, um, our website has some of that. Uh, Amy and Rachel are great resources in our office. You can call them and ask, uh, and we can go from there. We also do telehealth evaluations. So if you can't get to us because you're sort of far away, um, or if you're a little nervous or have medical problems and COVID might be an issue for you, we can do a telephone consultation. So you know, our job here is to service you as a patient because ultimately you know, our job is to make patients better. So with that, I'll open that up to Rachel if, if there are any questions from the audience. All right, thanks Dr. Bowen. We have a few questions here. We'll start with uh, the first one that came in. The question is, um, after the initial improvement that you stated, how long will the results last? And what is the average amount of regenerative treatments for arthritis in a knee? Also, what is the average pain level decrease across your patients in New Jersey who received this knee treatment on the one to 10 scale that you mentioned? All right, so let's uh, hopefully address those three things. Uh, number one is how long does it last? A um, little bit uh, more detailed answer than just a, uh, you know, how long. So the first thing is, is that, as I said, generally the benefit you start to see starting around three to four weeks. Most people in a lot of different research uh, studies will plateau somewhere around the 12 to 14 week mark. Uh, from there, people can, you know, have benefit for over a year, say for PRP, for mild to moderate arthritis in the knee. Um, for tendon and ligament issues, that may be you know, pain relief for until the next injury. Um, you know, if your knee isn't perfectly straight and it's, you know, not quite aligned so well or your job or activity hobby doesn't allow you to have perfect mechanics um, or we just can't get the way we want, you may slowly wear down the tissue again. It's not really that the treatment wore out. It's really that you just wore the area down again. Um, it's sometimes easier to know, hey, I, my knee's feeling great, and I went helicopter skiing, and I fell down the mountain, and my knee hurts again. It's sort of an obvious thing to know uh, versus a slow wear down. But there is some data we have uh, for shoulders out to three years, uh, and they've maintained their benefits. Uh, there's a couple groups that have uh, presented data on knee arthritis out to five years, and they've still maintained that. So we don't have enough data to really make definitive statements uh, beyond um, benefit, you know, pretty much plateaus around that three month mark and can last over a year. If you have a surgery, you can't really repeat it. Um, I don't want to minimize the uh, sort of process as well as a monetary issue with having this, but if you get two, three years of benefit, we are learning things every day. Uh, there might be another option or you can repeat the same option again. So that's, so the first thing about how long does it last? Um, and then Rachel, what were the other parts of that? Sure. The second part is what is the average amount of regenerative treatments for arthritis in a knee? So our goals for all these treatments is sort of a one and done. So um, we're not really a series of five or 10 or whatever it is. Um, it's generally, we try to get this one and done and go from there. There are some reasons we may do it more and that's individualized. Um, and there are some individuals who may get 70% improvement and they go, listen, I'm older. Um, I've made money. Uh, I don't want my kids to have it. Uh, whatever it is, I'm spending my, the money on my health now. I'm going to try it again and see if I get more out of it. We don't have a lot of data on that. Again, it's an individual decision that we can talk about, but um, there are some people that we've done repeat based on what they wanted to obtain for goals, and they actually did get some benefit, but generally one and done. 
And then I think the other part of that was how much percentage wise do most people get improvement? Correct? Uh, the question specifically was what is the average pain level decrease? Yeah, so we don't really follow that uh, per se. Um, we look at patient reported outcomes measures. And those patient reported outcomes measures do have a component of pain uh, scale, which we could get into our database and look at. Um, I would say, you know, it's different depending on what the problem we're treating, whether it's a tendon or a joint, depending on the duration, things like that. Um, but the patient report outcomes look into more than just absolute pain. It looks into function. And so if you're a high level athlete and you come into me and I think you're 50% better and you say you're 20% better, it, it, the patient, that the client, the customer is always right. So the, really the patient report outcomes is based on what you can do. I had another patient who is just happy to get on the, his knees, play with his grandkids and go up a split level without pain. I thought he would say 25% better, but he actually told me he loved me, said he's 100% better. So um, again, I can't directly answer that question honestly to know I, without looking at our data to say, what is the absolute number of reduction for pain? Uh, but people have uh, significant pain reduction and improvement in function. And that's really what we look at. Some people will ask, well, do you get MRIs? What's the MRI look at? We look at two Fs. We look at feeling and we look at function. Because ultimately, if your MRI looks a lot better and you have no pain relief, you're not happy. Or if your MRI looks the same and it's horrible and you're able to run marathons, what do you care? Um, so sorry I didn't exactly answer that question. Uh, hopefully that uh, you know, addresses the person adequately. Okay, the next question is, um, on average, what percentage of patients that receive like a knee treatment procedure, regenerative procedure, end up actually needing surgery? Yeah, again, another uh, question that hasn't had the uh, easiest of answers. Um, if you have mild to moderate arthritis, um, I would say those people do very well. Um, I would probably have someone start out with platelet-rich plasma. Um, and then if they did well for a year or two, they could repeat it, or they could go to something more like adipose fat or bone marrow. Um, so they might have it repeated and wait. Um, we just don't have enough data to say exactly the number of people who have failed and the more severe the patient is. Uh, so say they have severe arthritis, um, they're overweight, they don't take care of themselves, they don't eat well, they may have diabetes. I would say those are more likely the patients that are gonna fail. Although we've had patients in that category who say either I'm too sick to have the surgery, my surgeon doesn't wanna do it, or they say there's no way I'm gonna do it because I'm not the healthiest person and I know it's gonna be a long recovery and it's gonna to be tough, so I don't wanna do it. And it's a, some of these people have surprised me about how well they've done. So um, unfortunately we can't say like the total need that this is the absolute predicted model. We're trying to get to that with data biologics and data collection where we can put in somebody that say is, you know, 60 to 70 years old, who's had maybe uh, one clean out arthroscopy, a meniscal tear, resection, um, and who knows what else, a couple steroid shots and see what that is. But we just don't have that data yet. Okay, and then the next question is, do we use exosomes in our injections? So we do not use any exosomes because uh, of a few reasons, but number one, exosomes would be a drug. Uh, they're not um, an FDA approved drug. Um, FDA has come out specifically and said they are a drug and they don't have a purpose that um, has been approved. So that would really be a big problem. And so we do not use exosomes and I would caution anybody about um, getting them done. I know there's a lot of marketing out there about the exosomes, uh, but I would do a lot of research on uh, anybody using exosomes. The 21st Century Cures Act was passed. And as of December 1st, the FDA and FTC will most likely go uh, be much more aggressive at going after providers, groups, and industry that are not being compliant with the regulations. And exosomes may be sort of that one highest on people's list. That's sort of the new flavor of the advertisement day today. Um, perinatal tissue or things you call amniotic fluid was sort of the flavor of the day a year or two ago. Again, still around quite a bit, but um, again, FDA regulations uh, limit us from using it at this time. Okay. And um, the next kind of comment slash question is that I heard treatments can have a systemic effect in the body. What does this mean? 
Is it a healing effect on organs and other systems as well? Great question, great comment. Um, you know, the, the whole thing is we inject something into the knee and then say a month, people are better. Well, there, the question is why? Um, no one grows or regrows cartilage within nine to 12 months, even if it occurs. One of my uh, first fat cases that I did uh, a few years back, um, horrible, bad meniscus tear on the outside of the knee in uh, a sort of manual labor kind of guy, owned his own company, and uh, tried to get an MRI. We ended up getting a repeat MRI about 14 months later. Guy was at the gym, he was exercising, he was like 100% better, he was fantastic, he did great. And the MRI 14 months later looked just as bad as it did day one when we did the treatment. So the structure and the uh, picture where everybody comes in and says, oh, my knee is horrible, it's bone on bone knee arthritis doesn't really dictate how well people will um, have an outcome or how bad they might be. Um, so that's sort of the first part and leading into the second part. So why does someone get pain relief in the first month or why they get pain relief in a year when the meniscus didn't get better? Because the cells have a systemic, as the person alluded to, uh, immunomodulatory effect. So the immune system is intimately connected with the pain system uh, and a lot more things we won't get too detailed into, but a lot of these cell-based treatments probably first effect is on the immune system, which modulates inflammation, um, that modulates pain, and it's probably one of the main reasons why there's pain relief. So one of our colleagues uh, treated people who have this tight kind of skin, and um, they get a thickening or tightening of one of the valves, or one of the, sorry, the pipes that come out of the heart. And so he injected the tight fingers, he injected all the fingers with uh, fat or adipose. And they noticed in the future that that tightness of that connective tissue in the pipe out of the heart actually went back to pretty much normal. So yeah, these cells, uh, when you inject in some area, can have a, a systemic or global effect. A colleague of ours did a knee treatment uh, thing where we treat, he treated one knee, the other knee got better. So um, there's definitely a lot more research and a lot more questions that we have, uh, but probably the immune system is uh, underrepresented in the way people think about what's happening. And as I talked about in the beginning, the cells in a Petri dish are not the way they work in our body. And when they work in our body, they modulate how the inflammation, the immune system, and the healing are going on in a joint or a tendon. Um, and so that's probably one of the effects. And joints and tendon ligaments are different. So we can image ligaments and tendons with ultrasound and do PRP or something else. And we re-image in them months later and they can be a lot better. Um, so a lot of stuff for us to, to learn. All right, the next question is one that we actually get asked quite frequently. Uh, what is the difference between using adipose versus bone marrow and how is it decided on which procedure to use? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, a lot of uh, camps out there, they're sort of religious zealots. On one side they go, oh, fat is it, and bone marrow is horrible. And then the other group is bone marrow, they go, oh, bone marrow is it, and fat is horrible. Um, the problem is we just don't have enough research out there. So there's really only been about one study in the um, orthobiologic realm by a colleague of mine, Dr. Mountainer at Emory. And he looked at similar people that had arthritis in the knee, one group treated with bone marrow, one group, one group treated with fat. And pretty much at the end of it, the outcome was the same. So sometimes in patients, it can be a coin flip. You know, which do you want? When we say bone marrow, people sort of go oh, and lean back and say, I've heard that's really painful. And when you say fat, everybody rolls in and say, ooh, I get a free tummy tuck, this is great. Uh, and people's spouses and my staff, and everybody wants to donate fat. So um, that is one of the things, but really bone marrow and uh, fat or adipose are fairly similar in the process. They're just different. They both have pain involved. Um, they take about the same time. There's no huge advantage or disadvantage to really either, um, despite what a lot of people will say. So then it comes down to, well, which one to choose? Well, one of the limitations of bone marrow is that you only get a finite amount. And so if someone has one joint, okay, it's an option. But if it's gonna be multiple joints, um, you probably would have a substandard treatment to do multiple joints. Bone marrow has probably the best data uh, right now, although maybe PRP is getting there to put it in a disc. So if, and there's really not a lot of data from fat in a disc. There's also some FDA considerations for that. Uh, there is a general a neurosurgeon in Atlanta who had done some, not published yet. Unfortunately, he passed away. 
Um, so right now, um, bone marrow would probably be uh, one of the more choices to put in a disc if that was an issue. Uh, moving on to the advantage of fat. If you're gonna have one or multiple joints done, uh, fat is uh, the option in most patients because we mostly have enough fat to take. Um, there are though some very thin, um, either military or athletes where we wouldn't be able to get enough fat from. And so that may be a limitation, but again, that's a sort of case by case basis. So hopefully that gives a little overview and insight about fat versus bone marrow. Okay, and the last question we have here is how much are we able to figure out about an individual's health situation via telemedicine? In other words, is it an in-person visit is an in-person visit essential in order to see if someone is a candidate for a non-surgical treatment? Yeah, I mean, today I think we still need to have the physical exam uh, with the uh, necessity being the mother of invention and a lot of app-based things where we can measure people's motion. That could be the future, but there's still a lot of stuff we can do virtually. And so just for the sheer fact of getting a history and an exam uh, that's just somewhat relative from another individual that's sent to us, to have imaging that's reviewed, uh, to talk to someone about their general health and supplements and medicines, uh, answer specific questions. We can go a long way, um, but that's not always the key uh, because if someone's got a pinched nerve in the back and they have a hip problem and they have a knee problem, the question is what is really the source of the symptoms? And sometimes laying out of hands is an absolute in that kind of situation. Sometimes it's fairly simple and we can make a pretty educated recommendation, always with a caveat, things could change if they walk in that day. Um, we've had a few cases where we thought it was one thing and they came in and we ended up changing what we we're gonna do. Um, I do get a little nervous though, um, uh, giving absolutes uh, on telemedicine, telehealth, because uh, we really wanna look at the joint above and below the area, look at the whole individual. Um, but hopefully we can do a lot and go a long way with the telehealth if necessary um, because of either COVID restrictions, anxiety, um, distance of travel. And then if it's something someone wants to pursue uh, in office for the final evaluation and recommendations. Okay, so it looks like it's all um, in terms of questions, but if anybody has any additional questions, that number that is on Dr. Bowen's PowerPoint, you just give that a call. Um, Monday through Friday, and one of us are more than happy to answer any additional questions you might have after thinking about what we discussed in this webinar. But in terms of Q&A, um, that, that's it on my side. So yeah, just one last thing. I will post this up on our YouTube channel. So anybody who's looking at this after the live event, by all means, they can uh, look at our website for some questions or give us a call, set up a console, um, something like that. So I want to thank everybody for signing up, for attending. I hope they all have a good night, stay healthy, be well, and uh, all the success with whatever treatment options you choose for what's bothering you. So thanks again.